So I watched this documentary called Jesus Camp. I know what you're thinking. Master Creature, are you going to attack religion again? Why can't everyone just leave religion alone? One, I've never attacked religion. Two, if religion is ever involved in public media, like movies, documentaries, television, radio, internet, etc., the ones who broadcast their religious beliefs, practices, or dogmas through public media give their implicit consent for the public to give critiques in response to that which is broadcasted. And the same goes for me with my audience. Feel free to critique my own criticism and we'll just critique each other up the ass and have a hot, wet, critical anal orgy. The documentary was made back in 2006, so this is not anything new. It's about a bunch of evangelical Christian kids who go off to summer camp to make new friends and happy childhood memories. Sort of. I have nothing against religious camps in and of themselves. I have nothing against religion in and of itself either. I have multitudinous religious friends, family members, and subscribers. I listen to numerous religious bands, including As I Lay Dying, I the Breather, For Today, and Flyleaf. My idol, J.R.R. Token, the writer of the Lord of the Rings novels, was Catholic. However, that does not exempt me from having contention with certain beliefs and actions of certain religious individuals. But let's take a look at some of the scenes featured in this remarkably controversial documentary. Reclaim America for Christ? What do you mean reclaim? Last time I checked, we had separation of church and state, and we can adopt or refuse to adopt any religion we want. But it doesn't matter, right? Let's make everyone in the country adopt your religion because you can't stand the idea of individual freedom. I'm sorry, usable? You exploit the minds of children to spread your religion because you acknowledge that they're naive and easily manipulated? Okay, go on. I have an idea. Let's raise our kids to be so devout to mathematics that they're willing to lay down their lives for it. One plus one equals two, and if a kid knows that, he can suicide bomb a bunch of infants who don't know it. And it's all justified because he had the truth. I love how you somehow conflate the concepts of truth and faith. It's the Christian faith, but it's the truth. Do you need to have faith that one plus one equals two? Do you need to have faith that we breathe oxygen? Do you need to have faith that Barack Obama is the president of the United States? No, because it's the truth. And if you know that something is true, it wouldn't be a matter of faith anymore. Just like if there was evidence for something supernatural, it wouldn't be supernatural anymore. It would be considered natural since evidence for its existence would indicate that it exists within nature. Something cannot be natural and supernatural, just like something cannot be truth and a matter of faith. You might as well say married bachelors exist. You're contradicting yourself and your words have been rendered meaningless within the first 12 minutes of the documentary. Congratulations. An explosion? You're referring to the Big Bang and you're calling it an explosion? What's next? You're gonna refer to a dolphin and call it a fish? That's like the hunchback of Notre Dame telling you to stop slouching. A book that's titled Creation Through Physical Science says, Science doesn't prove anything. <laughs> he also didn't say put on a pea soup colored shirt, but you're doing it anyway. Cherry picker. Allow me to read you some excerpts from freethought.mbdojo.com slash foundingfathers. One of the many attacks on our country from the religious right is the claim that our country is a Christian nation. Not just that the majority of the people are Christians, but that the country itself was founded by Christians for Christians. However, a little research into American history will show that the statement is a lie. Those people who spread this lie are known as Christian revisionists. They are attempting to rewrite history in much the same way as Holocaust deniers are. The men responsible for building the foundation of the United States were men of the Enlightenment, not men of Christianity. They were deists, who did not believe the Bible was true. They were free thinkers who relied on their reason, not their faith. If the U.S. was founded on the Christian religion, the Constitution would clearly say so, but it does not. Nowhere does the Constitution say the United States is a Christian nation, or anything even close to that. In fact, the words Jesus Christ, Christianity, Bible, Creator, Divine, and God are never mentioned in the Constitution. Not even once. Nowhere in the Constitution is religion mentioned, except in exclusionary terms. When the Founders wrote the nation's Constitution, they specified that no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. Article 6, Section 3. This provision was radical in its day, giving equal citizenship to believers and non-believers alike. They wanted to ensure that no religion could make the claim of being the official national religion, such as England had. The Declaration of Independence gives us important insight into the opinions of the Founding Fathers. 
Thomas Jefferson wrote that the power of the government is derived from the governed. Up until that time, it was claimed that kings ruled nations by the authority of God. The Declaration was a radical departure from the idea that the power to rule over other people comes from God. It was a letter from the colonies to the English king, stating their intentions to separate themselves. The Declaration is not a governing document. It mentions nature's God and divine providence, but as you will soon see, that's the language of deism, not Christianity. The 1796 Treaty with Tripoli states that the United States was not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. This was not an idle statement meant to satisfy Muslims. They believed it and meant it. This treaty was written under the presidency of George Washington and signed under the presidency of John Adams. None of the founding fathers were atheists. Most of the founders were deists, which is to say they thought the universe had a creator, but that he does not concern himself with the daily lives of humans and does not directly communicate with humans, either by revelation or by sacred books. They spoke often of God, nature's God, or the God of nature, but this was not the God of the Bible. They did not deny that there was a person called Jesus and praised him for his benevolent teachings, but they flatly denied his divinity. Some people speculate that if Charles Darwin had lived a century earlier, the Founding Fathers would have had a basis for accepting naturalistic origins of life, and they would have been atheists. We'll never know, but by reading their own writings, it's clear that most of them were opposed to the Bible and the teachings of Christianity in particular. Yes, there were Christian men among the founders. Just as Congress removed Thomas Jefferson's words that condemned the practice of slavery in the colonies, they also altered his wording regarding equal rights. His original wording is here. All men are created equal and independent. From that equal creation, they derive rights inherent and inalienable. Congress changed that phrase, increasing its religious overtones. All men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. But we are not governed by the Declaration of Independence. It is a historical document, not a constitutional one. If the Christian right extremists wish to return this country to its beginnings, so be it, because it was a climate of free thought. The founders were students of the European Enlightenment. Half a century after the establishment of the United States, Clergymen complained that no president up to that date had been a Christian. In a sermon that was reported in newspapers, Episcopal Minister Bird Wilson of Albany, New York, protested in October 1831, among all our presidents from Washington downward, not one was a professor of religion, at least not of more than Unitarianism. The attitude of the age was one of enlightened reason, tolerance, and free thought. The Founding Fathers would turn in their graves if the Christian extremists had their way with this country. Consider this. If indeed the members of the First Continental Congress were all Bible-believing Christians, would there ever have been a revolution at all? For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. 1 Samuel 15, 23. This passage refers to humans rebelling against God, a statement that establishes the precedence of unconditional subservience, which is further illustrated very explicitly by the following two passages. 1 Peter 2:13. For the Lord's sake, accept the authority of every human institution, whether of the emperor as supreme or of governors, as sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right. Paul wrote in Romans 13.1, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Would our founding fathers have initiated a rebellion if they thought it was a sin equal to witchcraft, a crime punishable by death? The Bible gives clear instructions to Christians on how to behave when ruled under a monarchy, as the founders clearly were. The founders obviously did not heed what was written in the Bible. If they were in fact good Christians, there would have never been an American Revolution. Compare these passages with what is written in the Declaration of Independence. When a long train of abuses and usurpations evinces a design to reduce the people under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Who were the Founding Fathers? American historian Richard B. Morris, in his 1973 book, Seven Who Shaped Our Destiny, The Founding Fathers as Revolutionaries, identified the following seven figures as the key Founding Fathers. John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and George Washington. Of these, only John Jay can be considered an Orthodox Christian. As Congress's Secretary for Foreign Affairs, he argued unsuccessfully for a prohibition forbidding Catholics from holding office. 
on October 12, 1816, Jay wrote, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers, and it is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. It is John Jay that the modern Christians have in mind when they talk about the Founding Fathers. Luckily for the rest of us, and all freedom-loving Americans, he was not in the majority. Sometimes Christians offer up the Pilgrims as an example of our nation's Christian founding. That is sheer ignorance on their part. The Pilgrims weren't the ones who crafted the Constitution that governs our nation. They weren't the ones who rebelled against England. The Pilgrims fled from horrible religious persecution in England only to practice the same horrible religious persecution here. The religious freedom so often spoken of in regards to the Pilgrims was espoused by them only when they were the victims. It was not based on any principle of fairness. It was a belief born of weakness, to be forgotten in their moment of power. Christian colonists branded non-Christians on the forehead with red-hot irons, bore them through their tongues, confiscated their property and threw them in jail, hanged them and burned them at the stake. That is what happens when Christians had their way. It's the Constitution that did away with Christian persecution. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That means people can freely exercise whatever religious belief they wish, Christian or not. Thanks to the Constitution, Christians can no longer persecute and kill those who do not agree with them. So yeah, Judeo-Christian values, your argument is invalid. False dichotomy. Nothing more, nothing less. Aw, see, that's an example of something I have no problem with. What do you mean by dancing for the flesh? If you just mean you dance for fun, Cthulhu forbid it's fun to fucking dance. You know, things that are fun or pleasurable should never be considered wrong or sinful unless those things are causing non-consensual harm to someone or violating someone's rights. And I say non-consensual harm because pleasure and harm can sometimes coexist on a consensual basis, but I digress. It's cool you like metal, but dancing should never be a matter of guilt, regret, or shame. It's dancing, it's not murder. Even if it was murder, your deity obviously doesn't have a problem with murder, so just rock the fuck out and have fun. We kicking it for Christ! Go on. Designed to destroy you. Go on. Wait, what? What? Yes! Harry Potter is a fictional character. He's fiction. He's not real. What the fuck? One, aren't there better things to preach to kids about your religion than executing a fictional character like love? Two, you're preaching death to a bunch of fucking kids. Are you insane? Three, I can't stand it when religion becomes an excuse to make someone your enemy. Obviously Harry Potter isn't real, but if you're one of these kids and you know someone who reads Harry Potter, what's going to be the first thing that pops in your mind? Sin. Then it becomes fear, anger, and hate towards the person you judge. It's one thing to judge someone if they strangle puppies in front of orphans, but what's so reprehensible about being a Harry Potter fan? What if someone is an Eagle Scout and a Harry Potter fan? What if someone is a firefighter who pulled 10 people out of a burning building and a Harry Potter fan? It's a sad bullshit excuse to condemn a person. That's all. Training young children to be obedient servants. How typical. Yeah, sure, just tell the kids that they're phonies and hypocrites. It's good to know these kids can have a real mentor in life who can really help build their self-esteem. Army of God. First you preach the execution of a fictional character. Next you preach subordination. Then you preach humiliation, now you preach militancy? Imagine a world where all religious people act like this woman with an agenda of indoctrinating things like the death penalty, servitude, shame, and belligerence to young children. This is what we call kicking it for Christ. It's an entire room of children just sobbing their eyes out because they were convinced they were impure, unclean, immoral sinners who need to be cleansed. And their ideal exemplification of a sin was Harry Potter. It wasn't beating up other kids, it wasn't stealing money from your grandma. If I ever told a child that he was immoral, he'd have to do something like smash a kid's pottery project in art class on purpose. But Harry Potter? Harry fucking Potter? This is worth making young children feel so fucking ashamed. He admits that it's hard to believe in God because he doesn't see him, he doesn't know him, and sometimes he doesn't even believe what the Bible says, and it makes him feel guilty. Nobody should ever feel guilty for questioning their beliefs. If I told you to believe in the flying spaghetti monster and you were a bad person if you doubted your beliefs, it's probably because I know these beliefs deserve to be doubted and yet I still want them to maintain their power and control over you. If we didn't question what we thought, 
the world would still be flat. They can't even fucking tell ghost stories without getting reproached. Does your intolerance know no bounds? And I want to call bullshit on this guy condemning ghost stories because they don't honor God. God supposedly says to focus on those things that bear truth and those things that have beauty. And this guy wants the kids to focus on the good things and the things of God. They were laughing. They were having fun. How is that not good? How does that not hold beauty? You got your shit backwards, dude. If kids are laughing and having fun, that has no beauty. But if you have a whole fucking room of kids crying their eyes up because they're submerged in a gargantuan flood of guilt and shame, that's so beautiful. Who the fuck put you in charge of a fucking children's camp? There you go. Stick to your guns and light your own fucking path. That's what I'm talking about. Best scene in the whole documentary. Stone. Not stones. What do you mean the government takes Jesus out of schools? Kids are taught about Christianity in public schools and world history class. They aren't taught to believe in Christianity, but they learn about its influence in world history and world cultures. But that's not enough for you, is it? You want kids to convert to Christianity, and you want creationism to be taught in science class. Public schools are open to kids of any and all religions, dude. It's called freedom. Something that you obviously have a big fucking problem with. Try moving to a Muslim country where apostasy is punishable by death. Let's see how long it takes you to move back here. What? Make war with them! Whatever happened to peace? Maybe it's because your cognizance has been defiled by being forced by the concept of war. I'd feel like it's arduous to coexist with humans of different perspectives too if I were somehow convinced that they were my enemies or opponents. I don't even feel like Becky Fisher, the pastor in this documentary, is my enemy or opponent. I don't have enemies. I don't have opponents either unless I'm playing Yu-Gi-Oh or something, but that's a fucking card game. I respect those opponents. I shake hands with those opponents. What do you do with yours? What would you do with Harry Potter if he were real? Explain Christian vegetarians then. You mad, bruh? Now, I'm not crazy about abortion, but the government does not own your body. You do. No child ever asks to be born. The choice of whether or not a child is brought into this world is reserved entirely to the mother, and it will always be to the mother, not the government. We don't have to debate about murder, pillaging, and slavery either. It's written in the Bible. Deuteronomy 2010-14 As you approach a town to attack it, first offer its people terms for peace. If they accept your terms and open the gates to you, then all the people inside will serve you in forced labor. But if they refuse to make peace and prepare to fight, you must attack the town. When the Lord your God hands it over to you, kill every man in the town. But you may keep for yourselves all the women, children, livestock, and other plunder. You may enjoy the spoils of your enemies that the Lord your God has given. The children profess that they intend to take the responsibility of training others as soldiers of God. They wish to cultivate God's army in order to carry out God's will. Here's my issue. I'm not omnipotent, and I can carry out my will just fine. But God is omnipotent, and he needs people to carry out his will for him. He created the universe. He created mankind. He created every human being alive. Everything that happens is part of his divine plan. He has absolute knowledge and absolute power. But he needs people to do his shit for him. He spends his eternal existence watching his own creations carry out his own will, even though he's omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. What kind of eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent being needs soldiers and martyrs? I need to emphasize on this. This guy knows everything. He knows who he is going to create and who he is going to punish. So he knows who is going to help before he even creates them. In this sense, why would he create people he knows that are going to help? Why would he create souls just to send them into eternal torture? He creates souls that are inevitably hell-bound with no other purpose but to feel an eternity of pain. That's like a mom giving birth to a baby just so she can throw it into a fucking oven. Except the mom does it to billions upon billions of babies, and the babies never stop feeling the pain. Do you know what I call an omniscient being that creates a soul and then sends it to hell? Malicious. Malevolent. Evil. There's no justification for that. Giving everyone equal freedom going to destroy us. <laughs> I think I have a good idea of what's capable of destroying us, and it's not equal freedom. You know, if I had a kid, and he or she asked me a question like, Daddy, what is God? How do you explain the concept of God to a child? What could I possibly say to him or her? I know exactly what I would say. God is an answer for most of the world's questions. Where do we come from? Why do we do the things we do? What's right and wrong? 
Some people think someone named God made us, made the world, and says what's right and wrong. Everyone sees God differently. You know what things are make-believe? Movies are make-believe, cartoons are make-believe. We're not make-believe, we're real. Some people will say, God is real, but no one can prove he is. We don't know everything about life, and if there's something we don't know, sometimes people say God is the answer. But there's always another answer we can find, even if it takes a long time. And no matter how long it takes to find another answer, we will find an answer that isn't make-believe.